Okay, everyone, um, good morning and welcome to the um, October Soils Network of Knowledge webinar and our six monthly um, mark for these webinars. This month's um, presenter is Mick Rose and Mick's a project officer on the Grains Research and Development Corporation project being run by New South Wales DPI. Um, and in this project Mick's doing work to better understand how herbicides might affect soil biology and grain production, hence the title of his presentation. So Mick's interest is the interaction between plants, microorganisms and their environment and it's has led him to work in a diverse range of uh, projects in a diverse range of locations. He's worked on the use of constructed wetlands for improving water quality, plant growth promoting organisms, abiotic stress tolerance in plants and organics. Thanks to Abby for the opportunity today um, and thanks for everyone for joining in. Um, so this morning I'd like to talk to you about our recently commenced GRDC funded project entitled Does Increased Herbicide Use Impact on Key Soil Biological Processes? Um, this is a five year project and we've we started at uh, the beginning of the year um, and I guess really the first uh, question that you might have is why is GRDC and why are farmers interested in the effects of herbicides on soil? biology and processes and why now? Um, herbicide data or data about herbicide use is notoriously difficult to, to come across. Um, this graph here shows some data from the US uh, that was recently compiled by this author Benbrook. Um, you can see here this data, the uh, diamonds shows the amount of herbicides applied per, ki per kilograms per hectare uh, to the three major US crops, cotton, corn and soybean. Um, and, and generally you can see it, an increasing trend so that we're getting more herbicide apply, applied per hectare. Um, this is consistent with uh, uptake in uh, minimum till and no-till practices um, whereby more reliance is placed on herbicides for effective weed control. A similar trend you can see here in Australia, these white diamonds here, um, however data for the actual herbicide applied to, to crops is not readily available. So instead we've got here the value of the herbicide applied um, and I've just scaled that per hectare of grain uh, produced each year. Um, so you can see a similar trend here. The authors of, of this uh, study put, put the decline here of herbicides applied down to the fact that uh, herbicide chemistry is um, becoming a lot better and a lot more effective at lower concentrations. Um, but you can see that the trend is starting to, to turn upwards and, and we're getting more and more herbicide applied. Um, as well as that, there's also a lot of interest from, from social groups, from the public, um, largely driven by the fact that uh, GM crops that have been introduced um, have changed the spectrum of herbicides being applied to crops. And you can see here, this is, this is data from the US study showing the increase in glyphosate applied per hectare. And you can see that as a proportion of the total herbicide applied, um, it's increasing a lot more rapidly. So there's a lot of focus on, on glyphosate in particular um, and chemicals being applied to GM crops. Uh, the second reason that that GRDC and farmers are interested in why herbicides might influence soil production is the increasing recognition that uh, soil functions and so soil biology and, and the functions they provide um, really give a lot of value that is, is kind of not accounted for to agricultural systems and crop production. So recent estimates put it down to between $300 to $500 per hectare of unaccounted value provided by soil. Um, and most of these relate to functions provided by the soil biology. So th this slide's quite complex, but you can see, sorry, you can see here that many of these processes are driven by so soil biology. Uh, in particular, nutrient availability, uh, so the turnover of organic matter returned to the soil, um, transformation and retention of fertilizers applied to soil, um, and also the provision of nutrients from the soil and atmosphere through biological processes. Um, secondly, the relationship of, of pathogens to crop production and how the, the total soil biological balance relates to uh, 
disease occurrence um, is, is also of great interest. So there's a lot of speculation about herbis how herbicides might affect the soil biology um, and how that can in turn influence crop productivity. So really we want to explore this over the next five years of our project um, and in particular our aims are to define and identify the herbicide concentrations at which significant negative effects occur. Um, so many of the studies that have been done to date work by conducting a, a kind of ecotoxological ecotox approach whereby increasing concentrations of herbicides are applied to soil and certain responses are measured. Um, usually these studies report certain negative effects but whether or not they occur at herbicide concentrations um, which farmers are using in, in the field is a, is a different question. So we want to identify what is the relevance of any effects that might occur and secondly we, we want to identify which processes and which soil biological communities are most at risk. Um, following on from that we would then like to tease out what kind of farm management practices might influence that risk. So what are the effects of uh, increasing the amount of organic matter in soil, does that providing more resilience to the soil microbial population um, and the soil biology, how does water uh, influence these processes um, and with the effect of climate change how might heat and, and other stresses such as drought impact um, on the risk posed by herbicides. So the first step of our project was to review the literature which is what we have done over the last six months or so um, and that's what I'll be talking about today, what data is already out there and what do we know already um, and furthermore where are the knowledge gaps and what do we need to know. So I'll just quickly talk you through our project team and roles. Um, it's a national project based uh, out of Wollongbar here in New South Wales. Uh, we've also got collaborations with Queensland, Nikki Seymour at QDAF, uh, Southern Cross University, Quick Test Technologies in Sydney, uh, Victoria and Depi, University of SA and over in the West Craig Scanlon and Gavin McGrath um, contributing as well. Uh, as part of the project we'll also be conducting a number of field trials. Um, so we'll be transferring uh, from our literature review to undertaking a number of studies in the glasshouse and, and the laboratory to, to look at the effects of herbicides on particular microbial processes and then transferring that into the field and seeing how uh, practically relevant those results might be. So what do we know so far? This is just some data from our initial review uh, whereby we did a, a large uh, literature search just to take in um, as much knowledge as we could. So we were searching for the effect of herbicides on soil biology and function um, and these data represent the experimental uh, evidence that is available already in the literature. Um, so it's a good check to see what kind of uh, herbicides are being focused on in the literature um, and it's quite similar to the spectrum of herbicides that are being used around the world. So you can see here that the most data that we have available is on the glycine group of herbicides um, of which glyphosate is the main chemical being used and you can see that there's almost twice as much interest or more than twice as much interest in, in glyphosate than there is of any other herbicide. Uh, I've just got some chemical structures here, I don't want to go too much into the chemistry but I'd just like to point out that many of these herbicides as well as containing carbon also contain smaller amounts of macronutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. So from the point of view of soil biology, um, certain microorganisms can see these chemicals as a food source. Um, so whether or not they interact detrimentally or beneficially to the soil, soil biology um, is hopefully something that we can tease out. We're also going to be looking at uh, the sulfonyl ureas, um, not so much the second group here, not so much the chloroacetamides. Um, most of this data comes out of the US where herbicides such as metolachlor and alachlor are used for maize and soybean production. Um, we'll also be looking at atrazine which has had quite a bit of media attention particularly in the US where uh, it's highly mobile and has been detected in groundwater um, 
but we'll be keeping the focus of, of this to soils. 2,4-D, um, trifluralin, diuron, um, and finally difluf diflufenicin. These are our focus model compounds that we'll be conducting research on. Um, interestingly, you can see here that although diflufenicin is used quite a lot in Australian grains industry, there's really very little data about it in the literature. So already we can see that there's certain knowledge gaps where we're not sure what the effects of, of some chemicals might be. Um, within all these classes, I'd just like to make the point that you know, there's, there's numerous different chemistries. Um, so each class represents between five and 20 different, different compounds. So there's a myriad of products on the market um, and, and coming up with specific recommendations for every single chemical will be quite difficult. Um, generally though, the chemistry within a class is quite similar um, and we assume that they will have a similar function in soil and effect in soil. Before I go too much into the data, I'd just like to point out that what we found from going through the literature preliminary is a bit of a disconnect between what happens in the field and what is done in the laboratory. Um, farmers will apply their product at rates per hectare, um, but in ecotoxological studies, many of the dose response uh, experiments look at herbicide concentrations in terms of milligrams of herbicide per kilogram of soil. Um, so to come up with these concentrations that they're testing in the laboratory, many scientists need to make assumptions about how deep a herbicide applied at a certain rate will penetrate into the soil and also the bulk density of the soil. So that, for example, a number of authors whose studies we've, we've looked across um, suggest that glyphosate might only be distributed through the top centimetre of soil, in which case they come up with the concentration of 80 milligrams per kilogram. However, over time, with rain irrigation and, and other soil processes, um, we'll get a distribution, a movement of, of a herbicide through the soil, which will decrease the concentration. So that if we assume that a different herbicide might distribute through the top 10 centimetres of soil, if it's more mobile than glyphosate, a herbicide applied at 2.2 kilograms per hectare moving through the top 10 centimetres will then have a concentration 10 times lower than, than what it might be in the top 10 centimetres in the top one centimetre of soil. So this has some practical um, implications for conducting experiments in the laboratory, but also when we take that to the field and, and we're trying to work out the relevance to crop productivity, if we're assuming that the, the herbicide only has the impacts in the top centimetre of soil, what relevance does that have to a plant um, that might grow through the top centimetre of soil and explore the rest of the soil profile? even if there are effects in this top centimetre, will that impact on crop productivity? Uh, secondly, herbicides dissipate over time. So once a herbicides apply, they start moving about and also breaking down. Um, but importantly, this differs from farm to farm, between soils and also different environments. You can see here from this graph that even within a single soil, this data here shows the breakdown of of 2,4-D um, and most of the herbicide has disappeared from the A horizon by two weeks after application. However, if the herbicide moves to the B horizon, you can see here that it takes almost 50 days for this herbicide to dissipate. So even within the same soil, you can get different rates of dissipation of a herbicide. These also, the, this study also looked at the application of uh, herbicide degrading microorganisms and you can see that when genes are present that can degrade the herbicide, then the lifetime of the herbicide is a lot shorter. Um, so what this suggests is that herbicides will probably have the largest effect immediately after application, but over time we might see that this effect att is attenuated, so that there might be a, a short duration effect um, that doesn't continue over time. All right, this, 
graph is a little bit complicated, but what I just wanted to do here is point out um, the different modes of actions of the, the different herbicide classes. And what we can do from this is speculate which of these herbicide classes may impact on the soil microbiota um, through their mode of action. So what we have here is this red colour indicates that it's, it's highly likely that that mode of action will affect that particular um, biological group within the soil. And of course, algae being photosynthetic organisms are generally pretty well impacted by all herbicides. Um, that has large implications for, for river and marine environments where algae um, form the basis of primary productivity. But for the soil environment and crop production, um, it's probably not as important. So um, although there's not too much data out there about that, um, we're more concerned with the fungi, the bacteria um, and the mesofauna. So what you can see is that uh, glycine, which incorporates glyphosate, uh, the sulfonylureas and the imis all have a kind of medium, what we would guess is a medium hazard towards fungi and bacteria. And that's because this enzyme, which the different enzymes that these chemicals inhibit are also present in these organisms. So glyphosate, for example, inhibits um, the synthesis of uh, branched chain amino acids. Um, fungi and, and bacteria also rely on this pathway to produce their own branched ch chain amino acids. Similarly, the sulfonylureas, um, uh, sorry, glycine impacts aromatic amino acid synthesis. Um, they're responsible for a lot of uh, secondary compounds in plants um, that have a role in plant protection, um, but this pathway is also present in fungi and bacteria. Similarly, the sulfonylureas, um, that's where the uh, pathway for branch chain amino acid th synthesis is inhibited. Um, and that is also present in fungi and bacteria. The imis also impact on that pathway um, and we expect them to have slightly higher activity towards those um, groups. Uh, I'll just point out here as well that the triazines, the phenylureas um, and some of the other herbicides that impact on photosynthesis, because those pathways aren't present in the majority of the mesofauna and the microbiota, um, we're presuming that they probably won't have as great an effect as some of the other classes. Um, the dinitroanilines may have an effect on protozoa. Um, these microtubules, the same pathway that is in plants is not present in animals, uh, fungi and bacteria. However, there's some evidence that it may exist in protozoa. And these protozoa are responsible for um, I guess, regulating the ecological balance by feeding on fungi and bacteria. So there may be a slight impact there as well. So what I'd like to do in this talk is just focus on some of the, the chemical classes that we anticipate may have a greater effect on the soil biology and function. Um, and that's glyphosate and, and the sulfonylureas. Glyphosate is um, highly contentious at the moment. There's a lot of talk about glyphosate in the public uh, arena. Um, much of that's probably to do with um, big business and Monsanto, um, but also the increasing use of glyphosate also, uh, I think, has played into the minds of the public, but also farmers as well who are worried that if they're relying too much on the glyphosate, um, aside from possible resistance in weed species, um, what is that doing to the soil? So from our review of the literature, I've just put together this table here um, as a bit of a broad brush uh, approach to suggest which, which effects might be possible, um, the, magnitude, the magnitude of any possible effects, so how far will it push a particular function and how long will that effect last. Um, so here I've got listed the two main 
biological groups that we've classified in soil, the microbiota and the mesofauna. Uh, and down here I have some of the, the major functions that contribute to crop productivity. So what we found that in terms of glyphosate, with respect to nitrogen cycling and phosphorus availability, there's not much data to suggest that glyphosate applied at label rates on broad acre crops will have any impact on nitrogen availability and phosphorus availability. There's some evidence to suggest that it, that it can shift the balance of the soil microbiota. Um, however, this is just in a few studies and generally speaking, the effect will not last for more than one month. Um, interestingly, I've got here the direction of the effect, so is it, a, is it a negative effect, is it a suppression of the microbiota or a stimulation? Some studies have observed suppression, some studies have observed stimulation. Um, so this is really important as well. And what does that mean for crop, crop productivity? In terms of the mesofauna, um, also some studies have shown a, f a few effects, but overall, um, most studies show that at label rates we're not seeing uh, too many effects on the mesofauna. Generally speaking, if they don't like it, they will avoid it. So they will move through the soil to, to areas where there's lower concentrations of it. Again, there's this uh, short duration of effect. Um, what I'd like to focus on is these two aspects here, carbon turnover and disease. Um, there's really quite a lot of data on, on the effects of glyphosate on carbon turnover uh, and there has also been a lot of attention on whether or not glyphosate impacts on the occurrence of disease, the likelihood of disease um, when crops are being sprayed with glyphosate. So this data here comes from about 40 different papers. Um, so all the data points have just been thrown together um, and what you're looking at is the effect of a glyphosate application to soil on respiration, so CO2 emissions from soil. On the x-axis here we've got the concentration in soil um, and I've just put it on a log scale because some people are interested in what happens if you spill <laughs> some pure chemical on the soil, so these are very high concentrations, so uh, one represents 10 milligrams per kilogram, three represents 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, so here we're getting very high concentrations in soil, unlikely to be seen um, out on the farm when you're applying glyphosate uh, to a crop or to a fallow. This here represents approximately the label application rate um, and what we have on the y-axis is the effect ratio. That means um, the effect of glyphosate compared to a control that does not receive glyphosate. So a ratio of one means that the respiration from a pot receiving glyphosate is exactly the same as the respiration from a control that has not received glyphosate. If the, if the data is above one, that means that glyphosate has increased respiration relative to the control. If the, the number is less than one, that means that glyphosate is suppressing respiration. Um, and I guess what is most noticeable here is the, is the scatter of data. So some studies observe suppression, some studies observe an increase. Uh, sorry. But generally speaking, there's few significant effects and if there is an effect, um, it's usually not less than, not more than 50% either way. Um, at concentrations higher than label application rates, you can see here a stimulation of respiration and generally this is put down to the fact that glyphosate contains both phosphorus and nitrogen um, and therefore provides additional nutrients to stimulate carbon turnover. Um, but really I guess the take home message from this graph is that at label application rates uh, there's not much of an effect on carbon turnover and respiration from soil. This is the same data but looking at a duration effect. So how does the effect change after glyphosate has been applied to soil? 
Um, and what's most noticeable here is that you get a large pulse of CO2 emitted soon after application, but this is attenuated over time. So we get a drop off and after say a month, um, there's no real trend with respect to respiration. So you can see here pretty clearly that any effect of the herbicide is strongly observed in, in the short term, but over time uh, the effect dies down. And this could be due to a number of factors, um, but probably most likely is the fact that with respect to glyphosate at least, it has a strong affinity to soil and becomes less bioavailable over time. Um, most herbicides are also transformed, so, so degraded over time, um, and herbicides won't have such a strong effect um, once their concentrations are reduced in the soil. So just moving on to the effect of glyph the impact of glyphosate on disease, um, this is a recent review that has summarised um, much of the data on the impacts of, of glyphosate on pathogens and plant disease, and the authors conclude that most of the available data supports the view that neither glyphosate resistant transgenes nor glyphosate use in, gly in uh, glyphosate resistant crops increases crop disease. However, they also point out that there may be effects of glyphosate in um, transgenic crops uh, to do with mineral nutrition and or disease under particular but uncommon conditions, e.g. specific soil, environmental conditions, particular crops um, or glyphosate formulations. So this really highlights the complexity in teasing out systematic effects of any chemical. And note that here we're just looking at glyphosate, we're not looking at the entire spectrum um, of herbicides that may be used on crops. Uh, the reason that glyphosate could have particular impacts um, in certain systems and in certain soil types is that the ecology of pathogens is highly complex and glyphosate might interact with any component of that interaction. So you can see here that not only can a herbicide increase the incidence of disease, but in some circumstances the herbicide can also assist in reducing disease. Um, so herbicides can have direct impacts on the pathogen um, and like we saw glyphosate has an impact on amino acid synthesis in microorganisms and depending on the particular microbial species if they have um, an enzyme that is sensitive to glyphosate they may be inhibited. So whether or not that occurs to a pathogen or it may occur um, to a plant growth promoting microorganism um, can change the balance of the microbial species in the soil and that could be for, for the worse or it could be for the better. Herbicides applied to the plant may also have an indirect through the plant, so if there are low level impacts on the plant that may not be visible to the naked eye, this does not mean that they haven't been changed, that their chemistry, biochemistry has not changed in response and they may signal this change within the plant through the roots to the microbial community and again this can result in increased disease or it could actually reduce disease. So again you can see the complexity of the interaction um, and the fact that we really need to tease out uh, under what circumstances we might be seeing more disease or not. Moving on to the sulfonylureas, um, you can see here that there is a lot less data than there is for glyphosate um, and not many studies have focused on disease or the mesofauna. Um, what we have found though that there appears to be um, quite uh, an interesting effect on nitrogen cycling. Um, so I've put here there's a possible effect on nitrogen cycling. Again the duration of the effect um, it doesn't seem to be more than one month in the short term, um, but unlike glyphosate where we're seeing uh, some increases and some decreases of impacts of, on, on functions, here generally the sulfonylureas seem to have a negative impact. Um, 
so this slide shows um, an accumulation of data from three different studies, uh, four different studies, um, one of which looked at the long-term impacts of a sulfonylurea on soybean, uh, which I have here, the five-year um, study. Um, and in this diagram, CR stands for conventional rate. Um, and these arrows represent whether or not the herbicide has an impact and which direction that impact might be on a particular process. So here we have nitrogen fixation and in one study it was shown that repeated applications of chloromuron ethyl over five years had a consistent negative impact on nitrogen fixation. It reduced the diversity of nitrogen fixing organisms and also reduced the amount of nitrogen fixation in the soybean plants. Some short-term impacts have also been observed in other studies to do with uh, mineralization of organic N, so conversion to ammonium, and also nitrification, the conversion of ammonium to nitrate. Um, but in these studies, for example here, these effects did not occur until the concentrations reached 10 times the label application rate. Um, so, and, and as you can see, the duration of the effect was uh, less than a week, so that microbial populations and that process returned to normal in a period of less than one week. Um, in terms of nitrification though, there seems to be more of an impact at conventional rates. Again, the effect is temporary, um, but, it, but it is happening at conventional rates in these studies. Um, interestingly here, although there's a negative impact on nitrification, depending on what the farmer wants, this may actually be beneficial to crop production. So many farmers now are applying um, synthetic nitrification inhibitors to slow down that process um, and draw out the conversion of ammonium to nitrate to give a, a longer term supply of nitrate to the crop. So even though there might be this effect uh, on the soil, whether or not that's a bad thing may depend on the situation. Um, so I just wanted to focus in a bit more on this effect here of the repeated applications of chloromuron ethyl um, to soybean. The reason that they saw depressed uh, functional responses there over a long term was put down to the fact that they also found these her, uh, residues of this herbicide were accumulating over time. So here you can see the treatment with no herbicide, um, treatment of the herbicide for five years and, and application of the herbicide for 10 years um, annually. And what you can see in the corner here um, is the level of chloromuron ethyl um, at the start of the experiment. Um, using soil from those treatments and you can see an increasing amount of the residue in the soil over time so that then any additional applications of herbicide are lifting the residues, the residue level above what it would be um, had that herbicide not been applied to the fields before. So what we're getting is, is an accumulation of herbicide residues and, and then not breaking down fast enough in that soil. Um, Quite a bit of work has, has been done in Australia looking at the degradation of sulfonyl ureas in, in soils um, and there is a strong pH effect such that at uh, neutral and alkaline uh, pH uh, these herbicides tend to persist a lot longer whereas if they're being applied in, in quite acid soils, so less than pH 5, then they will degrade a lot faster. Um, so as you can see, the, the magnitude and the duration of the response of any soil biota will depend a lot on the concentration of the herbicide remaining in the soil. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, overall in our literature review, we, we, we didn't come across any red flags to suggest that there are some irreversible detrimental impacts to soil function in the short term. 
Um, what we did find though is that the ALS inhibitor group, group B, um, the sulfonylureas in particular, could pose a relatively higher risk than some of the other classes, especially with regard to nitrogen cycling. Um, in terms of glyphosate, uh, despite the increased use, there's no systematic evidence for enduring impacts of glyphosate across soils, but this doesn't rule out the fact there could be uh, some less common site-specific effects, um, particularly with respect to, to disease interactions. Uh, but I guess overall what we did find is that there are a lot of knowledge gaps, particularly regarding the chronic effects of long-term repeat applications. And I think um, anecdotally that is what farmers are most interested in. So how does their herbicide application schedule and re regime over a number of years start to impact on um, soil function? And if farmers are applying similar um, herbicides that that are not degrading in soil, then that could, could really pose some problems down the track. Um, but what we, what we really need is, is to undertake a lot more modelling to work out how the herbicides move and are transformed in soil so that we can predict effects over time um, and work out whether these effects are just going to be a short-term um, impact that, that may fix itself over time. Uh, or whether they will have some longer lasting impacts on, on the capacity of soil for, for crop production. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge as well Abby for organising the webinar series um, and also the project team members for contributing to this presentation and the work that's been done so far um, and also to GRDC, in particular Martin Blumenthal for, um, for his assistance. Uh, so I'll leave it there and happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Mick. That was really great. And I suspect that lots of people will be interested in the research that's going to come out of the next part of the project as well. Okay, Janelle Jenkins wanted to know if the review has been published, Mick. Uh, not yet, Janelle. Um, it's nearing the point where we can send it into GRDC for comment. Um, but should be published soon um, and I'm sure it would be okay if, if you're really keen to have a read then I'm sure we could um, send you a, a draft. Okay, so it's best to get in contact with you about that. Yeah, yep. Okay, so the next person to ask a question is Steve Kimber. Off you go Steve. Uh, Mick, can you make a comment on how many of the studies enabled you to discriminate the difference between the effects of the active ingredient on on uh, function versus versus formulation effect? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Probably about half the studies used the active ingredient alone, um, and probably about half the studies applied the or one or more commercial formulations. However. Very few studies actually compare um, within an experiment the active ingredient to a commercial formulation. Um, from the few studies that are available, um, and, and this includes insecticides and fungicides as well, generally speaking it appears that the formulation will have more of an impact um, than the active ingredient alone. And whether, whether or not that's a synergistic effect um, of both the active ingredient ingredient and, and other compounds within the formulation or whether it's an impact um, mainly due to the other compounds in the formulation is really yet to be determined. Um, so, so as part of the project I think that will be something we're really targeting. Um, from a regulatory point of view, you know, um, APVMA are probably most interested in the actives, however from a practical point of view um, I think most farmers won't really care about the, the active so much as to whether the products they're using are having an impact. So, yeah, and, it's, it's a good point. And Mick, can you just clarify that when you say formulations, you mean the added um, things that are put within the herbicides to make them stick to yeah, soil that, or whatever? So just to clarify that for that's everyone. That's right. Yep, that's right. So there's a, there's a number of different compounds that, that may in the herbicide, be in the herbicide formulations. Um, that, that could be having that effect. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question is from Rai Kukana. Off you go. Um, 
thanks for the seminar. It's really or webinar. It was really enjoyable. Um, but also, it confirms we we did a, a study a few years ago for rural industries R and D cooperation for some of the impact of herbicides, and we found similar things. In fact, um, for uh, herbicide, generally speaking, you don't find uh, much impact on the soil microbial health as far as that survey or that review uh, was concerned. And I think your your findings kind of confirm that. Um, yeah. The one technical point was that, particularly for the glyphosate data, when you see when you were looking at the respiration data and particularly increased respiration. Uh, sometimes increased respiration is also a, an indicator of stress. So yes, um, under stress the microorganisms can respire more, and so that's that's not necessarily just kind of conclusive evidence that it doesn't have an effect, and may not necessarily be driven by the nutrients because the nutrient fraction, if you like, addition coming through the glyphosate is not likely to be that significant to convert into. Uh, but that's that's an element which is worth looking at. Um, I assume this focus of this project is purely on herbicides, and I was wondering because the probably any concern uh, about the potential impact on soil health or microbial health is likely to emerge from insecticides and obviously grain industries, uh, grain industry, certain grain production systems use use insecticide. I just wonder whether that is exclus excluded from this current project. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Rai. That, that, I'll just quickly address the first comment. Yeah, I completely agree with the um, respiration data and the fact that that might indicate a stress um, to the organisms. I didn't show it there, but we also have pulled out some data from the um, microbial biomass um, in some of those studies so that together with the respiration and the actual microbial biomass we can start to address um, whether those respiration effects are a stress related effect or whether it's resulting from you know an increased biomass within the soil but it's a really good point um, and something that we need to keep in consideration. With respect to the second question this project is focused solely on herbicides um, and I think for the grains industry that's um, mainly because of the volume of herbicide that's used relative to insecticides and fungicides. So I think there's probably about four times um, as much herbicide used as insecticide or perhaps even more and, and similarly five to ten times as much herbicide as fungicide. But I agree that um, you know fu fungicides in particular that are targeted to, to kill fungi um, mm. that may or may not impact on plant health for, for beneficial reason, reasons, um, yeah, is also of great interest. Uh, so hopefully we can we can look at some aspects of that down the track. But but really, this um, current project is just looking at herbicides. Yeah, thanks, Mick. Okay, thanks, Roy. Um, okay, our next question is from Lucas. Would you like to ask your question, uh, Mick? How many of the studies looked at herbicide mixtures? Because I certainly know that in sort of the ecotoxicological assessment of other pollutants, it's often found that mixtures of chemicals tend to be far more uh, toxic, I guess, than uh, the sum of the individual parts. So uh, can you comment on that and whether you've found, uh, found the same result with the herbicides? Yeah, I guess as with the, the formulation versus the active, there's actually not that much data about herbicide mixtures out there. Um, and the data that is available is often uh, from studies that have been conducted in the field that have perhaps not put in place as many experimental controls um, as other studies, so that it's really difficult to interpret what might be happening in terms of effects of, of herbicide mixtures. Um, and again, the, the data is really inconsistent. So some of the studies that I've actually read have shown that some, some mixtures negate the effects of each other so that when, when the compounds are placed in, individually, they might come across with a negative impact. But when they're put together, that negative impact disappears. So again, it, it's very inconsistent, but, but there's a big lack of data. Um, and, and particularly quality data, I think, from, from that point of view. 
I, I, I guess one of the things that needs to be pointed out as well with the herbicides is that you know, the other key mechanism for weed control is mechanical tillage. And you know, what would the relative uh, destruction of soil processes be from herbicide compared to mechanical tillage? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I would suggest it would be quite high. Um, yeah. But ag again, yeah, um, I'm not sure um, there's been too many um, studies looking directly at that as well. And there's also been a few studies looking at the relative effect of pesticides versus fertilizers. And interestingly, a few of those studies have shown that um, some fertilizers will have a more severe effect in the short term than the pesticides will. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I guess it just sort of raises the point that, you know, these types of studies, we shouldn't just be looking at you know, purely a, a laboratory study at the impact of glyphosate on a particular soil function. It has to be taken into consideration in a farming system. So, yeah. you know, what's the overall impact of, of, of these particular practices? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lucas. Um, they're good comments. Douglas Fox has a question. Thanks, Abigail. Um, if I look at soil function, it's not a medium to stand a plant in, but it's the actual home of microbial life. And soon we know less than 20% of what the microbial life does in the soil. I feel as though it's very difficult to understand what effect it has on the percentage we do not know. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree entirely with that comment, um, and, and I think that's really something that we'll have a lot of difficulty um, coming to terms with. I guess there, there's kind of two ways of, of looking at the problem, whether we work from the top down um, or the bottom up, so whether we, we drill right in and try and work out what's happening to you know, ind individual um, microbial species or taxa and then try and work out how that all fits together to have an impact or crop function. Um, or whether we keep an eye out in the field to whether we're seeing uh, a particular effect and then try and tease out what might be causing that effect. Um, but, but I agree that it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to work that out. Thank, thanks, Douglas. And then our last question is going to come from uh, Carol Rose. So I've unmuted you, Carol, and you can ask your several questions, I notice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, well, I'll only ask one of them. Mick, the, uh, the, in the experiments, are the, um, is the carbon, that's, that is the result of the death of the plant, which is your, why you're using the herbicide in the first place, is that taken into account? Um, many, many studies, no. Many studies that have been done in the laboratories focuses solely on a bare soil um, and herbicide being applied to that soil. Um, whereas the field, um, there have been a lot of good good field studies done, particularly um, from David Wardle, who I think was originally from New Zealand. Um, and they, they've done a lot of longer term field studies and they point out that that, that has a large impact. So, so rather than the herbicide having direct impacts on soil biology, um, the effects that they've observed, they put down more to the, the indirect effects in the, lar in the larger system. So, you know, the removal of weeds from a system, um, although in the short term, you know, that, that has a carbon input into the soil, if the, if the weeds were left there and allowed to grow, there's a lot more carbon goes into the system in that kind of natural state. So, um, yeah, I mean, the question of direct versus indirect effects is also another, another challenge. Carol, did you want to ask your other question? I thought it was a good one. Uh, the, uh, are the experiments looking at herbicide and nutrient interaction? So if, uh, for instance, farmers don't do herbicides alone, they do fertiliser applications at the same time. I have not come across one study looking at that, <laughs> but it's an excellent point. Yeah, the, the studies that I have seen with regards to fertilisers um, generally keep them separate so that they're looking at an, an impact of a, of a fertiliser versus an impact of a pesticide. Um, but I guess, um, you know, a lot of the studies would use agricultural soils that have a reasonable level of nutrition in, inherently through 
past fertilizer practices, but in terms of controlled experiments, no, I haven't, I haven't really come across many. Now, you, well, you made that point that the, um, the nutrient within the, the herbicide could be having an effect. So if you've, if you've got urea put on at the same time, there's a whole compounding issue. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I think the point that Rye made as well is quite important there, that some of these studies where they do see an effect um, of nutrients from herbicides are those studies where the herbicide has been applied at 10 to 100 times the label rate. Um, so when the herbicide's not, when, when the herbicide's applied at the label rate, really the, the amounts are quite small um, and they may you know, those nutrients might be available to a, a select component of the microbiota, but um, yeah, in terms of the, the greater context, um, how much impact that's having, is, it's another good question. But it's, it could also be a solution for farmers if you can show that something will ameliorate an effect. Yeah, I mean, that's right, and, and it, it um, from the point of view of herbicides having having kind of fungicidal activity, um, that was something of interest that I, that I hadn't anticipated. But you know, some of the herbicides, um, you know, also counteracting pathogens um, and and the impact of, for example, the SUs on nitrification. If it's working as a nitrification inhibitor, yeah, I mean, there's kind of some unintended consequences that might be more beneficial than detrimental. Thanks. Okay, well thanks again um, Mick for your time, I think it was really um, interesting and useful and, and as we see there's many more questions to be answered <laughs> which yeah. keep people busy for a long time but yeah thank you very much again and thank you everyone um, who attended and hopefully we'll see you again uh, next month for the next webinar which is uh, slightly different, it's about all about the new eSpade platform from the Department of um, the Office of Environment and Heritage and how to interrogate that for soils information. So if you're interested in that, look out for the invitation. But uh, thank you once again, everyone, and we'll see you again. Bye.